All right, we're going to be in Acts 18 and 19 today. So if you have your Bibles, then uh, you can turn to Acts 18. And that's where we're going to be for the majority of the lesson today. And what I want to do is I'd like to uh, notice some things in Acts 18 and 19. As we see, this guy named Apollos, who seems like he's a great guy, and he's doing a lot of good work. And then he meets Aquila and Priscilla, and he realizes something is a little bit missing. Something's a little off, and we want to see how he responds to that. But then we see Paul go to the place where he, where Apollos was, and start teaching and preaching there. And he doesn't go in and just like tear down everything Apollos did, but he does correct the group that, that was there. The reason I want to talk about this today is because this is actually leading to a little bit of a series that I'd like to do on the establishment of the Ephesian church. Our theme this year is from Ephesians 4. If I had been smart enough to do this, I would have put our, our uh, theme verse up here with a nice image that we got and everything, but I forgot that, so sorry about that. Um, now that I think about it, you could, you could kind of picture it maybe in your mind. It's a big tree that just says, growing in our ministry, and it's from Ephesians 4. So that means that part of what we're talking about is growth individually and collectively, but also it's talking about what is our ministry, what is our service, what does our work look like? And we, we've been talking about that some in, in some Bible classes, but I'd like, to, I'd like to start with Acts 18 to help us look at that a little bit more and to lay some groundwork for what we're going to look at in the next couple weeks from Acts 19 and Acts 20 as we look at the Ephesian church specifically. So I say all that to say that if, if you're sitting here and you think, well, Blake must be referring to something that happened like, you know, last week. Or I remember talking to Blake and specifically saying this thing, and now he's preaching on this. Uh, this has nothing to do with, this is going to sound bad, this has nothing to do with you. Um, although if you find application, you feel like that you're the catalyst for some things that I'm saying, join the club because this is actually me being the catalyst for what I'm about to say. So I want to talk about growing and understanding. And so if you're sitting here thinking, well, I don't know certain things, and that has been evident, and now I just feel embarrassed. Well, again, you can join the club. I, I've been there for a while in that club. So this has nothing to do with anybody here other than just looking at Scripture. If you find application to it and you see some ways that you can grow or some things you need to put in your life, then well, that's fantastic. Again, join the club. That's, that's kind of the whole point of looking at Scripture and the way we're going to. So just to set the scene, because I, I don't want to read all of Acts 18. We're going to pick up in verse 24 in a second. But just to set the scene, Paul has gone back to Antioch to reset and start his third journey. So he's already gone through Ephesus. He's gone through other places. He's gone back to Antioch, and it's time to start his third journey. He heads out, and he goes through Galatia, and he goes through some northern or some southern parts of, of what was Asia at the time. And he makes his way to Ephesus. And that's where Acts 19 picks up. But before he gets there in Acts 18, we see that Ephesus has this guy named Apollos that is preaching and teaching there for a little while. So I want to pick up in verse 24 of Acts 18. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus." I want to start by just looking at Apollos, and I want to see what we can learn from his example. And really, it's like, how do you act right when you know you're wrong on something, or when something's missing, when there's something lacking in your knowledge, how do you respond? How do you act right? So first, I just want to point out that this man was so zealous for God. I mean, in verse 25, it clearly says that he was zealous and fervent in spirit. So he was zealous for God. He had passion. He had desire. He had great knowledge, it says in verse 24. He was competent in the scriptures. He taught accurately the things about Jesus in verse 25, and he actually was able to reason with people in the synagogue. He, he spoke boldly. So you have, you have knowledge, you have zeal, you put it together. 
He's teaching in the synagogue. He's speaking boldly about Jesus, but there's something missing, right? Something very missing. Now, we see he's devoted to teaching and using his gifts, though. The, the way that Luke describes this guy, Apollos, this guy would be at the top of our list if we were looking for gospel preachers to come to a meeting. Or maybe even just, come, please come be with us. You know, come like work in this area. He might be above Paul on the list. I mean, if you knew someone that was eloquent in scriptures, Paul said he wasn't eloquent. Uh, he, was ele- he was competent in scriptures, but not an eloquent man. He didn't speak as well. Now, maybe he was being humble, but I don't know. It might be that Apollos just has him has him like a little bit on the edge there as far as being a dynamic speaker. And then also he is knowledgeable about scriptures. He is speaking boldly. This guy's at the top of the list saying, who can we get to come for our meeting in the fall? How about this guy, Paulus? Like I hear he does great things at Ephesus. I hear he is really lighting it on fire over there. But there is something that's missing. So he's accepting of being taught more. So he's a teacher and now he's being taught. That's a really difficult thing to balance out. How can a teacher be taught? Well, that's how they got to be a teacher in the first place, is they consider themselves a learner at some point. If, if we ever lose that, where we think that we're beyond the point of learning, then we're not fit to be a teacher anymore. That's, that's my opinion, at least. Let's actually go back and look a little bit further in Acts 18 and just read a few verses in Acts 18, starting in verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all of the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So then you go over to 18, in chapter 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila, at Sincrea, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. They came to Ephesus and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So, he's, so Apollos is accepting of being taught, but who's teaching him? Who's correcting him in, in Acts 18? Well, it's this, the, this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. What was their credentials? Like, so far in Acts 18, this is all we know about Aquila and Priscilla. Were they the ones that were reasoning in synagogues with the Jews? Well, no, it sounds like that's Paul. Now, he's with them, but it sounds like that's mainly Paul. Did they have a degree? Did they have a profession that was esteemed, where, where he would want, where Apollos would want to listen to them? No, it, it says they're tent makers. So you have this couple, they're tent makers, They've, been, they've traveled with Paul, so they're useful to Paul, which is a great reputation to have. But there's nothing about them that would cause Apollos to sit there and be like, oh, I didn't even see you were in the crowd. So, yeah, like tell me anything that I'm missing. What, how was I, what was I off on? These are just regular people that pull him aside and say, hey, we kind of we have something that it seems like you, you might be missing in your teaching." We, we heard something, and it seems like there's just one thing off. And it was about the baptism. Because all he was teaching and all he was talking about was the baptism of John. Now, that's all he was talking about. But when it came to baptism, all he knew was the baptism of John. So that's all he was preaching about. So Apollos is so devoted to God that he is even going to be accept, he's even going to accept being wrong on something. That's his devotion. That's his zeal for God is that he's able to be taught even though he's considered a teacher. The fact that they gave him a platform in the synagogue is a big deal. And then this couple pulls him aside and corrects him. That would just take a very humble man to take that. It would take a humble person to take that and accept it. So maybe a quick side point is, this is how Aquila and Priscilla handled the situation. We do see that Paul mentions in Galatians 2 that he actually withstood Peter to the face. Peter was wrong about something, and Paul stood up and corrected him in front of people. So we know that you could do either. Aquila and Priscilla took him aside, though. It was more appropriate in the moment to take him aside and say, hey, you know, we we really appreciate what you did. I don't don't know if this is what they said. This is probably how I would say it because I don't like being mean. Well, it depends, but I I usually don't like being mean. Hey, we, we really appreciate what you said. You said a lot of great things. Obviously, people really respect what you have to say. We heard you mention this one thing about baptism for repentance. Did you mean the baptism of Jesus? And he was like, 
Oh, no, I, I don't know about that. I, I was only taught, I only know the baptism of John. I didn't know, there, I didn't know that Jesus instituted a, a baptism in his name. So then he's corrected, and he goes on his way and continues teaching. So who is supposed to teach and bring things to light then? Is, is it just the teachers? Is it just a couple that are tent makers? Well, no, it, do, it doesn't have to be those people only. It's the one who has knowledge of what's true. If you know something is true and you hear something that's off, you take what's true to that person. You correct them. You tell them that there's something missing. And that sounds like it, it, it sounds a lot easier maybe than, than what I just said. But that's the truth. Like you just say, hey, there's something missing here. And I only know that because I heard what you said. And I just want to like fill in the gaps there and see if I can help you have a more complete knowledge. That's what they did with Apollos. So it's not just a preacher or a teacher. It's not just for elders. It's not just tent makers that can do that. It's any of us that can do that. So what we actually see is that he continued working even after being corrected. He understood that he could be wrong, but he didn't dwell on what he had been ignorant about. He could have felt down about his past teaching and thought, oh no, all those people that I, I only told them about the baptism of John. What am I supposed to do? I, I, I don't know what to do now. And maybe he did feel a little bit bad. But what we know is that he went about and taught more accurately because he was, because he was taught more accurately. And it says in verse 28, he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. I don't know how much of a delay there was in him being corrected and him going on his way teaching other people. It doesn't sound like it was very much. That's a great example for us. When you know one thing's off and then you fix that one thing, you just keep going. You just add it to your, your, your repertoire, I guess, and you just keep going. I don't even know if I said that word right. I've never known how to spell repertoire, but that's the best. I usually just say it fast. Any word I don't know, I say fast and move on, and now I just call myself out. But if it sounded off, it's probably because it was. This is an example for us, though. His zeal didn't go away. He kept zeal and humility, and God worked through that so these people could correct him, and he could go on, and he could go ahead and profess the gospel even more. So I just think Apollos is a great example for us. But now let's go to Acts 19. And let's look at the, the church or the, the city that he was in, in Ephesus. And beginning in verse, in verse 1 of Acts 19. And it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. And he entered the synagogue for three months, spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So Paul completes the Ephesians' knowledge. Yet Aquila and Priscilla complete Apollos' knowledge. Paul goes to Ephesus and completes their knowledge. It doesn't specifically say that Apollos was the one that taught these disciples. But it really seems like that's the case. I don't know why these stories would be back-to-back. They just happen to be in the same place. They happen to be off on this one thing that Apollos was off on. I think Apollos was there and was working with this group and teaching. and, And he taught them what he knew. So the one thing that was missing was the baptism of Jesus. Apollos had done good work at Ephesus, but there was something missing. And even though he taught the things of Jesus, and it, this sounds, it might sound kind of crazy that he taught the things of Jesus and yet he didn't teach his baptism. But if you were in that time, that makes a lot of sense. Imagine being a disciple of John the Baptist, and you know the one, that the one is coming. And then you hear that he came and that he died and he was raised from the dead. But then you just keep going on teaching some of the things that John taught you, mixing in with saying the Christ came, okay? And you need to respond. That doesn't mean your knowledge is full. There's there's just one thing missing, right? So he needed to be taught and these Christians needed to be taught more accurately. They needed to grow in their knowledge so they themselves can grow in their faith. I do feel like we have to address one thing, and that's why they're called disciples in verse 1 of Acts 19. 
If they hadn't been baptized yet, why are they considered disciples? Well, I don't know for sure, but I'll offer up just a couple of ideas. So the first idea is that a disciple is just a learner, and so they were learners. It doesn't say who they were learners of. They maybe were learners of John the Baptist, learners and followers of Apollos. But in Acts, it seems like disciples are only used to describe people that were Christians, that were followers of Christ. So I don't know why Luke would call them disciples if that was the case, but that is possible. Another option is that these people were considered disciples of Jesus without being baptized. Now, a problem that I see with that is that so far in Acts, in in the narrative, you just don't see that being the case. And also, I don't know why Paul would, would kind of press the issue. I don't know why he would say something was lacking if they were already considered disciples of Jesus. And maybe that just reframes how we think of things. Maybe that reframes how we think of what it means to be a believer or disciple. Is that the desire can be there, the heart could be there, and then you just you discover that, hey, there's one thing missing. And let's not try to nail down at what point you became a disciple. Let's continue to be disciples, which means we're con- constantly learning and growing. And if something's missing, you just add that. You change that. You fix that thing. So Paul baptizes them. I believe they receive the Holy Spirit when they're baptized, and then he lays hands on them, and then they receive these outward gifts of the Holy Spirit, being the tongues and the prophesying. I guess just uh, also another side note is if you look at the question in verse 2, and then you look at the solution that, that Paul offers in verse 3, or I guess they're both questions, but I think it's the solution, it seems pretty clearly that Paul is connecting receiving the Holy Spirit when you believe to being baptized. And if you go back to Acts 2.38, that's no shocker, because that's exactly what Peter said. Peter connects those things as well. So in our day and time, when someone is trying to figure out, well, at what point was I saved? Well, that's kind of a difficult thing for us to nail down, honestly. Because at what point do you consider someone a disciple? When When their knowledge is complete? Well, that can't necessarily be the case, because we see many people that are considered disciples when their knowledge was not complete. Fundamentally, I think we should try and strive to be like Apollos and like these people in Ephesus, where we don't get caught up in, how dare you say that something's missing? How dare you say that, that I don't have it right on this, on this thing? Because you know what? You know what all I've done? You know what I gave up? You know who? My, my, my parents taught me this, okay? Or we, we just don't get caught up in that. What we focus more on is, What does it look like to be humbly following and seeking God? And if I realized that I didn't repent like I needed to, well, I need to do that. So help me do that. If I wasn't baptized like I need to, then help me do that. What do I need to do? If I thought it was okay to continue living in a way that was displeasing to God by my job, because it's just a really awful job. I don't want to name any specific jobs, but but you just know that like I'm involved in sinful activity because of my job. I didn't know that was wrong. Now I know that's wrong. Help me figure out how to change that. Help me figure out how to get out of that situation. That's what a disciple looks like. And too often, I I just get caught up in my own mind about what does it mean to be saved or at what point was someone saved instead of trying just to focus on keep being a disciple, which is a constant learner and follower of Jesus, which means you're humble with your zeal. You're humble and you're going to continue to grow in knowledge. But that doesn't mean that every person that claims to be a Christian is. I want to go to 1 Corinthians 3 about this one point. 1 Corinthians 3, this actually was our theme verse, I guess, two years ago now. In 1 Corinthians 3, I want to start in verse 10 and just read 10 and 11. Paul says, and by the way, this is kind of interesting, he left Corinth. Apollos is in Corinth, and we're we're reading in Acts 19. So here he's writing to Corinth. In verse 10 of chapter 3, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anything or anybody is your foundation other than Jesus, you're not a disciple and you're not a follower and you shouldn't consider yourself saved or comfortable. You shouldn't consider God your father and your father that's in heaven without Jesus Christ being the foundation. And that's the point that I, I feel very confident saying that. 
So if someone else is your foundation, which, by the way, it's interesting that in Corinthians, Paul brings up several times that some of you are claiming to be of Apollos or Peter or, or even Paul. I'm just glad I didn't baptize many of you is what he says in, for, in 1 Corinthians. Why does he say that? Because these people were adhering to other people at times, or they had a temptation to do that other than Jesus. And Paul is making the point, if anything is laid as a foundation other than Jesus Christ, then that's not the foundation, right? So we know that something is missing if Jesus is not our foundation. But if he is our foundation, something could still be missing, and we just continue to grow in that. We grow in our knowledge, we factor in our zeal, and then there's growth and there's fruit from that. So what can we learn today from Acts 18 and 19 seeing this? I, I have just four application points for us today. The first is that zeal and knowledge leads to salvation and growth. I think we see that with Apollos and with the people in Ephesus. That you mix zeal, you mix, you, you mix in knowledge, you're going to have salvation, but there's also going to be growth after the fact. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. I want to read just a couple of verses from Romans 10. Romans 10, verses, verse 1 and 2. Paul says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Paul wants some people to be saved, but there's a problem. They have zeal, but not according to knowledge. What happens if you have zeal according to knowledge? Well, you can be saved. There's, there's, there's true opportunity for God to work in that if there's zeal according to knowledge. But if it's just zeal or it's just knowledge, there's not much God can do with that. And let's, let's go over to Ephesians chapter 1. Since he's talking to Ephesians in Acts 19, let's go to Ephesians 1. And let's see what, what does he say to these Christians after the fact, after he's been there, after he's visited them, after he's corrected them. In Ephesians 1, beginning of verse 13, In him, that being in Jesus, you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. What does he tell these people? Like, they, they now are knowledgeable. They have put on Christ. They have received the Holy Spirit. And he reminds them of that in verse 13 and 14. I think there's a chance that what we've read in Acts 19 is exactly what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It's like, remember that time when you put on the Holy Spirit. Remember when you had him as, as your seal for salvation, that he is the guarantee of your inheritance. The first thing Paul asked them when he got to Ephesus was, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Why is the Holy Spirit necessary? Well, according to Ephesians 1, it's because the Holy Spirit, he is the guarantee of our inheritance. So he wanted to make sure they had the Holy Spirit and understood that he was going to be the seal and the guarantee of their salvation. So we can learn from these Christians, we can learn from Apollos, that zeal and knowledge leads to salvation and growth. God does so much through just those two things. The second point is that correction is worth it. And what I mean by that is both ways, right? Correcting is worth it, and receiving correction is worth it. It's worth the pain. It's worth what's being torn down to be built back up. And really, it doesn't seem like there's much tearing down here. Like, in my mind, it's a lot more dramatic than it really seems like it is. Because when I think of being corrected, I just think, oh, man, that person must have had so much guts just to come and correct me. Because, like, there's a chance I was going to do, I don't know, react in a terrible way or something. And we just don't see anything like that with Apollos or these people in Ephesus. When something is lacking... It's worth it for someone else's sake to point it out. And if you have something lacking, it's worth it to hear what someone else says as they try to point out what you're missing. Correction is worth it. I want to quickly go to, you, you don't have to turn there if you already remember this, but when Jesus is talking to the rich young man in Mark chapter 10, actually Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have this encounter, but there's something interesting that Jesus said, or it says about Jesus and that Jesus says to the young man, it says in Mark 10, verse 21, after he says, um, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then, you know, Jesus goes through a lot of the commandments, and the young man says, I've done all these from my youth. Jesus looks at him, he loves him, and he says, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, 
and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Have you ever considered how silly it sounds to, for someone to be rich and be told, you lack something, go sell everything? Sounds like I have an abundance, Jesus. <laughs> I'm not lacking anything. If you're telling me I just have to go sell. What he was lacking was the devotion. What he was lacking was putting Christ first. What he was lacking was that at the top of his list were the possessions. And that needed to be taken away. And Jesus needed to be at the top of that list. It's hard to correct and it's hard to be corrected. But Jesus did this out of love. And we need to assume that other people do that out of love for us. And it's worth it. The pain of being corrected is only temporary if we actually have the humility and zeal for God like we need. I think one thing that's tough about correction is that we, we can think it's a betrayal of all that we've learned in the past or the people that taught us in the past. Apollos didn't look at it that way. The people in Ephesus didn't think, well, we can't trust you, Paul, because if we do that, then that's a condemnation on Apollos. And he spent so much time with us. No. When knowledge is lacking, when something's missing, you just add that in. You don't consider the condemnation it is on other people. You don't consider who you're rejecting in doing so. You just think of who am I following? Who am I accepting in believing this? The third point would just be that we need to obey what we know immediately. Like these people did it immediately. Apollos added to his knowledge immediately and got back to work. When one thing is missing, take care of that one thing. I mean, I feel like every week for the past three weeks after Richard's lesson on making decisions, I've just like, just kind of, it's like a pepper grinder. I've just like peppered it into my own thoughts and I've like peppered it into conversations with people. Just do the one thing you know is right and then see what the next right thing is after that. Well, if you've been lacking in knowledge in something and then that knowledge is filled up, well, do that thing. And just be prepared because there's going to be something else that you didn't know. And someone's going to bring that to your attention. When you don't know all that is missing, don't be consumed by all that is missing. Take care of the one thing you know you can do now. Paul realized that he was wrong and changed all he did in his life. Apollos was respected, but he was humble enough to accept correction. And the Ephesians followed Paul, followed what Paul said immediately because they trusted him that he was right and he had proved himself that he was right. And they did it right then. And the last point is that knowledge helps us to see more of good works. I want to go to Ephesians 2 and make this last point. Ephesians 2, and again, think about the fact that Paul is writing to these Christians that we just read about in Acts 19. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If you want good motivation and a reason to study your Bible and to meditate and to read more, just consider that it produces more fruit, that the more you know, the more opportunities for good works will present themselves. The more you learn, the more you should see what God has done and what God wants you to do. And what he actually said, what Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 10 is pretty incredible at the end there, that you should walk in them. This continual walk means it's going to be fueled by continual knowledge and understanding. So if you think of like a meter that you're like thinking, okay, like I can only go so far right here, okay? The more I trust that God like fills my knowledge and completes my knowledge, the more I'm going to be able to walk. Like when I was 16, I didn't know what it meant to actually care for other people. I just did the right thing to be respectful because I took karate and the person that I took karate from instilled that in me. And my grandparents and my mom instilled that in me. I said, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I open doors for people. I say, thank you. And I say, please, that had nothing to do with my faith. That had nothing to do with trying to be a Christian. But the mindset of just considering others grew as my knowledge in Christ grew. And it had nothing to do with karate anymore. I think that's how it works in our life. And that's maybe a simple example. 
But the more we know, the more we learn, the more we sit at the feet of God as we understand his character, the more we can put that in our life and the more our walk takes shape. So I hope that some of these things are helpful no matter what your situation is. But maybe just a couple things of like, if you don't know how to apply this, I'll give you just a few ideas. It's not just read to do your daily Bible reading. I mean, yes, that's good. But it's read to seek where are you missing in knowledge. Like, have that mindset as you read the scriptures. Like, where am I lacking, God? Help me to be filled up in my knowledge. That should be the heart. That hasn't been my heart. And I'm, I'm assuming that it hasn't been all of your hearts, or maybe some of your hearts. But when we do that, when we have that approach, there will be so much that's filled in. Once that's filled in, don't think about what you missed out on. Don't think about where you could have been if you had known that before or anything like that. Just think, all right, I know that now. I'm going to do something. And whatever that means you do, do it immediately. If that means that, you know what, I didn't know about this baptism thing. If it means I didn't know about this Holy Spirit thing, well, you're right there with those people in Ephesus. Complete your knowledge and grow in that and act now. Or it might be that you already knew about that, but you're like, well, I didn't know that this was a sin, or I didn't know that was a sin. So you, once you discover those things, you make those changes. It's simple as, as saying you repent. It's simple as confessing those things to God. And it might be as simple as having a conversation with someone you trust to say, help me to make some changes in my life. Whatever that is, don't delay. And don't think of it as a bigger deal than the way we just saw these Ephesians took it. I hope this is helpful. If you do need something, then this group is here for you. If you need to know who to talk to, I guess I'll be sitting back there with next to uh, Ryan. And so you can come back there and talk to me. There's other men and there's other people that are here. If you need to try and talk and figure out what is the next step for me, we want to help you figure out what that next step is. But you, you just need to reach out to someone. We'll have a closing song. Uh, we'll have a song and then I'll have some closing remarks after that.